Thank you. That's, this is the UH uh, concert choir. We just performed a spring carol by Michael John Trotta. Kind of, just a celebration of spring imagery and uh, and remembrance of uh, of happy happy springs in the past, which will be a little bit of a theme with the rest of our uh, the rest of our music. Um, the next thing is probably my favorite thing on the whole program uh, because I have nothing to do with it. Uh, and, and that's not because I'm lazy, but because I'm proud. Uh, and that my goal as an educator is to hopefully be obsolete. <laughs> to have my students not need me to do this. So, so to have a student soloist, student conductor, student accompanist, uh, it's just, I'm super proud. Uh, and also I want to thank the concert choir for the generosity of spirit that they've had throughout this process of having uh, having a, our student crew working with them daily uh, and, and preparing this the, the way that they have treated uh, treated Jenny and JD and Kat uh, with, with love and respect and support all the time. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. You guys are awesome. So uh, without further ado, this has set me as a seal. Uh, it is a setting of the Song of Solomon um, uh, and uh, conducted by our very own Jenny Prinky.
frame, then our next piece is the oh my I. Ah, we'll get myself together here in just a second. Uh, hmm, I'll think about John Bennett to uh, help with that. Uh, so, <laughs> Uh, very, very little is known about uh, the composer of our next piece, uh, about his life, uh, just that he wrote a lot of madrigals in the 1500s. Uh, but something really interesting about this particular, uh, particular madrigal is that it quotes a very, very famous, at the time, uh, John Dowland's uh, uh, lute song, A Flow My Tears, which goes, uh, well, I'm not going to do it in the same key, kind of an A. my tears. It's a very, very famous uh, lute song at the time. Um, anybody who's taken a music appreciation class has probably heard that piece. Um, and it, it quotes, this piece is based off of that opening melody from Flow My Tears and also his take on, on weeping so much that one would eventually drown to death in their own tears. <laughs> Elaine Hagen, Hagenberg's composition, uh, There Was a Time, it's based off of a, uh, a, a text by William uh, Woodworth, and it's a reflection of a time gone by, kind of like Spring Carol was just all, all happy memories. Uh, but here, the, it's not always happy. Uh, and we get this sort of floating ethereal piano line uh, over the top of sustained what she describes as rainbows of sound. And I love, I love that, uh, that imagery that she creates there because I think you really will sort of uh, hear the rainbow, uh, the skittles of, of choral music here. <laughs> so uh, there was a time.
Kierkegaard's uh, Erev Shel Shoshanim. Uh, the melody and the text for this were originally set in 1957 uh, by Yosef Hadar. Uh, this piece is now often uh, sung at weddings uh, as the bride enters. Um, uh, love is sort of ever present in this, uh, this arrangement. And I want to read you just a quick quote from the arranger because he says it much better than me. Uh, the use of compound meter at the beginning provides a gently flowing accompaniment while the rhythm of the vocal line is in simple meter suspends above it rather to complement rather than contrast. Later, meter changes and the tempo increases as the breeze blows through the roses at the dawning of a new day. Uh, a new perspective uh, for our waking lovers. Uh, the setting concludes with the return to the opening texture, once again reminding us that a song of love is perhaps better whispered than shouted.
want to take just a quick second before concert choir sings this, it, their last piece of the evening to acknowledge, acknowledge a couple of our graduating seniors. Uh, can I have Michael and Michelle come on down and be acknowledged here? Uh, uh, Michael Poe, this is your first semester, yeah. right? And so first semester is, is also the, the last semester. semester. He's graduating uh, in, in the spring with a degree in aerospace engineering. So I, you know, wherever will he find a job? <laughs> uh, anybody know anyone? Uh, but uh, uh, so we've really, really enjoyed having you with us. Uh, uh, Michelle, uh, you've been at least two years in this group, I think, right? right? This two, is. Yeah. Um, uh, Michelle is going to be graduating with a BA, uh, with two BA degrees, one in Spanish and one in music. Uh, well, and her next steps is to work as a translator while she's uh, continuing to practice and develop on violin and audition for orchestral, uh, orchestral violin jobs. So uh, thank you to both of you. I really appreciate you. Thank you. It's kind of awesome. <laughs> Our last selection for concert choir this evening uh, is uh, by the tune by Albert E. Brumley, who's probably most famous for uh, the melody of I'll Fly Away uh, in, in the gospel tradition. Uh, however, this piece uh, is among one of the 800 other songs that he also wrote <laughs> in, in his time. Uh, and, in, and Lord, give me just a little more time. Uh, we're asking for just more time in this life to achieve a few more good deeds that would help us look a little bit better on that judgment day. Uh, and so, uh, so that's sort of the, the motivation in the, in the text here. Uh, something interesting about a gospel tune is that it doesn't have any elements of call and response. It's all homophonic and homorhythmic. So the choir is always, always doing everything at the same time, which uh, is, is a little bit different than a lot of his other gospel.
it's just a second while we switch fire here. I normally don't like to talk about the first piece before we sing it, but since we're doing some, uh, some switching up here, uh, the first piece that we're going to sing is an uh, excerpt from uh, Haydn's uh, Heilige Gemass. Uh, and it actually composed five years after Mozart's death, and while Beethoven was already composing in late into his early uh, early period. So we tend to think sometimes it was like Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven for the classical era, but Haydn actually lived quite a long time, and so his, his latter symphonies are a very mature style, uh, and we really enjoyed working on this uh, energetic and, uh, uh, well, flexible, I think is the word for this, uh, this the Gloria. Our next piece, O Quam Suavis Est, uh, by Ivo Antonini, uh, is based off of medieval chant, but using a 21st century harmonic language and rhythmic, rhythmic aesthetic. So he tries to keep the prayerful uh, spirit of Gregorian chant while writing in a very much 21st century uh, you know, sort of harmonic language and, uh, and rhythmic idea.
gonna jump back in time uh, a little bit back to the Renaissance uh, when April is in my mistress' face. Uh, and so April is in my mistress' face, and July in her eyes hath place. Within her bosom is September, but in her heart a cold December. Uh, and so while the text is full of metaphor, uh, the, the musical description also sort of matches the mood. So the, the, even though the piece is in a minor mode, it begins rather joyfully and kind of playfully. Uh, and, and through the section in July, the, the melody soars up and we're very, very happy about, uh, about uh, everything about her. But then as the season starts to turn, the note values get longer uh, and uh, we lose some of the playfulness uh, in the polyphony that you heard, you'll hear at the very beginning of the piece. And it kind of gets a little more static as we're discovering that maybe her heart isn't matching her eyes, so. much loved him, uh, dating back to 1865. Uh, Copeland here begins with a simple accompaniment, uh, but it will gain strength and intensity, especially as we go into the third verse of the text uh, for the choir. Uh, at the River was actually used uh, fittingly uh, at memorial concerts uh, to, uh, to celebrate the life of Aaron Copeland, as well as concerts in the 90s to celebrate the life of
Thomas Tallis uh, is the perfect example of an early Anglican anthem. Uh, Tallis had the fortune uh, of, of serving under four different monarchs uh, uh, who had wildly differing religious practices uh, in, in the Anglican church. Uh, well, first it wasn't the Anglican church, first it was the Catholic church. But uh, anyway, you read about the Reformation, Reformation later. But, uh, but Tallis was actually one of the first co uh, composers to set this new <coughs> English liturgy uh, when he had been writing in Latin for most of his life. Um, uh, and so, so during, during King Edward the, the Sixth, uh, it was mandated the, that the services are sung in English and that the choral music is brief and succinct. Uh, to quote, to each syllable, a plain and distinct note. Well, uh, If You Love Me is a classic example of, of how uh, Renaissance composers uh, sort of did that. They did it enough to not get in trouble. Uh, but he, he, he flirts with polyphony over and over in this piece, but starts out in a homophonic texture. Um, uh, and it's a classic uh, ABB form. So you hear the opening section, and then we'll actually repeat the second section. So the, the, the head never comes back. So another brief uh, sacred choral piece, this time, however, in Latin, uh, it is attributed to Palestrina, uh, meaning they're not really sure, and it doesn't sound like most of the things he wrote. Uh, but what makes this piece interesting uh, is that it's homophonic throughout rather than polyphonic. Every, basically, everything else he wrote was in strict imitation all over the place. Um, and so. Another interesting thing I find about this work being placed in the middle of the Renaissance is that the harmony and the voice leading, especially in the bass voices in the choir, uh, begin to really function uh, like, like tonal harmony that we're going to hear going into the Baroque era later. So the, the, the bass line leads sort of in this one, four, five, one that we're going to hear you know, for the next, well, we're still hearing it in, in pop music now. Uh, so the sort of functional harmony that was uh, made famous by Bach is we're starting to hear that in, in this late Renaissance piece that they're not 100% sure who wrote it, but boy, were they looking ahead at the time.
Do I have to talk about these seniors without crying? I don't know if I can. We'll see. Uh, don't judge me too harshly. Can I? Can I have my first graduate seniors come, come down here? Um, some of these folks have been in this group for four years. Yeah. Um, so it's it's like hard to remember a time to come to work without you. Tasha, this is your first year, right? Yeah. I mean, you're amazing. It's been awesome having you. Um, but it's gonna be hard to imagine coming into work without seeing some like these are my coworkers. That, that's going to be a, a little challenging. Uh, first, we have uh, graduating here uh, is uh, Alan Burleson, graduate, graduating with a Bachelor of Science uh, in Computer Engineering. Uh, his plan is to get an engineering job to support what he actually cares about, making music. Tashler Green uh, is uh, graduating with a dual degree uh, in cybersecurity engineering and in music. Uh, about his future plans, he's staying in Huntsville uh, to work uh, in the missile defense industry uh, in some form of for, uh, cyber or software job. Uh, he's also going to begin an online master's degree in cybersecurity uh, through Georgia Tech in the fall. So we're going to miss him, but wish him all. <laughs> So Jenny Prinky, who you met uh, when she was conducting the, the concert choir, uh, is graduating with a Bachelor of Arts degree with an emphasis in vocal performance. Uh, she's going to plan to take the next year uh, to work in sacred music. She actually has a, a job lined up at Trinity Baptist in Madison, working under the direction of a longtime friend and colleague of mine, Billy Orton, uh, who is at First Baptist for many, many years, First Baptist Huntsville for many, many years, uh, and is now there. Um, and then the plan is after that to pursue a master's degree in sacred music. Definitely on the right path. Uh, uh, Erica Houghton is uh, graduating with a degree in computer engineering. Uh, the current plan is to spend a few years working uh, in the private sector in America before pursuing a graduate degree overseas, uh, hopefully in France. So I uh, wish you all the best with that. It's been amazing having you in this group, all of you. Just sort of lead, lead this ensemble by example uh, and help folks who are struggling with tuning forks for the first time and uh, just kind of all, all of the, the logistic pieces of it. I just really appreciated your personal leadership as well as your musical leadership. So thank you so much. All right. Let's, let's so we have one more piece to share with you this evening. Uh, Mudanzas. Uh, uh, by uh, Oscar Escalada. Uh, I'm going to read you what he says about it and then also prepare you for what you'll hear. Uh, so the Malambo is a gaucho dance originally performed uh, by gaucho dancers who were the men of mixed Spanish and Indian heritage with a reputation of being very honest and independent. They worked as cattle herders and are still celebrated by stories and songs because they are the heroes of the pampas, uh, the grassy plains around Buenos Aires. Uh, two dancers perform as a kind of duel. The first dancer draws a figure, uh, a muganza, uh, with, with his feet that must be then repeated by the, other, by the second dancer. The second dancer then adds by drawing another figure which must be duplicated by the first dancer. The dance is over when one of the dancers cannot uh, imitate a mudanza or cannot think of a new one. Uh, and so <laughs> the text of this piece is not a poem. It's not a story. Uh, what it is is just little snippets of words here and there that uh, conjure up images of these, these dance celebrations. Uh, so we get little things like uh, taco shacks appearing uh, and different birds uh, singing. Uh, what else we got? We got boys and girls playing. Um, we got the devil dancing sometimes uh, with us. Uh, so the malambo is almost always present in uh, in the text as we as we go through here. So it's it's not a traditional choral piece with sort of poetry. Um, 
what he does to, what uh, Escalada does to create this, uh, this piece is he, he basically writes an instrumental piece and then pulls it apart to make the choir sing all the parts. So I'm gonna have Ron actually, who doesn't play on this piece, um, uh, play just a little bit of it so you hear what, what it's gonna sound like and it actually sounds quite simple, almost idiomatic for the piano. Easy enough when you have 10 fingers, but if you only sing one note at a time, uh, which is where we're at, we have to really take turns uh, on every eighth note, every beat. Uh, so it's sort of a modern Hockett style where, where the melody is created by lots of little, uh, little rhythmic places, placements of notes. So without further ado, we got it.
thank you again so much for coming out this evening to, to celebrate the work of these students. Uh, if you like celebrating the work of students, uh, we got you this week, uh, tomorrow night. Uh, we have uh, jazz ensembles, uh, Jenny's recital Sunday at 4. Uh, the, the UH Keyboard Festival is basically all day Monday and Tuesday. Uh, I'm not sure there's a concert Wednesday, but I'm probably just missing one. Uh, and then Thursday of next week, uh, we have our, uh, an organ recital out at First United Methodist, and I'm sure I'm forgetting about 16 other things. But, uh, but lots, of, lots of stuff to see. Thank you so much for being out. We really appreciate you. Thank you, students.